Like many other countries, Ghana's political scene is a duopoly, shifting between the NDC and the MPP, however citizens vote. Many political watchers say that the state of play is the bane of Ghana. Over the years, attempts to introduce a third force into the polity have proved futile. But the 2024 presidential elections could be different. Two independent presidential aspirants have emerged, each of them hoping to break the curse of Ghana's two-party system. On Hot Issues today, we ask, who could break the duopoly and what does it take to do so? There's no doubt that my guest today is an accomplished man, both in his professional and political life. He served in government under two different presidents, but his presidential ambitions have never materialized. Last year, he said goodbye to the party he helped found, starting what he says is the innovative and revolutionary change Ghana needs badly. I am Kemeni Amano, and my guest on the program is independent presidential candidate and leader of Movement for Change, Alan Kojo Tremanting. You're welcome to Hot Issues. Thank you, Kems. You recently came out of a National Economic Policy Summit, or Economic Summit, that is. Um, what do you think that achieved? Well, first, let me tell you what the summit was about. Mm -hmm. It was to demonstrate the need for us as a country to build consensus and have a non-partisan, decent discussion about critical issues that confront us as a nation. But equally importantly, it was also to move our country from party manifestos to a national development plan and to have a stakeholder group dialogue on this national development plan. But equally important, importantly also, it was to provide a signal to the people of Ghana and also to the whole world that yes, kindly we have challenges in our country, but there is hope. And this is what mm. the whole summit was about. If you watch the summit, there's no denying that that conversation that you had over there for eight hours or so was really important. Yeah. But one would also argue that this is duplicitous of what the NDPC is doing, particularly the call for a non-partisan manifesto or development plan. I was leading this as an effort by a potential president of this country. The NDPC is arguably very important national institution, but that does not provide the leadership. The, the leadership and the vision of any country is set by the leader. And then national institutions then follow that vision. Mm -hmm. So yes, I mean, there's absolutely no doubt about that. The NDPC, and I've, I've been a member of the NDPC during those periods when I've been Minister for Trade and Industry. Mm -hmm. So the call, but, the call for yeah. a non-partisan development plan yeah, yeah. is something the country already has. That's, a, that's you know, that's yeah, what no, but it the is argument different. I'm making. Yeah, no, but it is so different. what's different? You know, the, what is different is that when you have a non-partisan conversation, as we did, you had representatives from different political parties, you had representatives from the business community, you had representatives from religious institutions, you had representatives from the business community, young, old, rich, and poor. And it didn't matter your stature mm. in, in the society. The NDPC is, as I said, an important national institution. But the kind of discourse and the type of people who meet to discuss the National Development Plan cannot be said to be the same as the kind of stakeholder grouping that uh, I'm talking about. So it is different. And when the direction is set, first by the leader, provides the vision, he mobilizes expertise, apolitical, from different perspectives, but people who know what they're about, and people who have the competence to contribute to that dialogue. So you have a working document, 
And that working document then is submitted to this broad stakeholder group. And then once there is agreement, then that is where an institution like the NDPC mm. can then take it up and do the further elaboration. I mean, so I, it has, the NDPC has a place in this. In this. But, but I'm talking about something different. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you, you know, th let's move away from that yes, so that absolutely. we don't belabor yes, the point. Yes, yes. What did you glean based on the conversations that everybody had uh, that day? What did you glean from the summit yes. at, at the end of the day? Yes, four things. First, how to fix the economy. Very important. I know we have many problems in, in our country, but there's no denial of the fact that our most critical development challenge is how to take us out of the economic ditch that we find ourselves in. That's number one. The second is how do we add value to our natural resources and also diversify our economy and create new growth poles for our economy? Is it not, is, is it not an indictment on all of us as a country? that we've depended on cocoa and gold for over 100 years to drive economy. It doesn't make any sense. There's nobody that is stopping us from thinking beyond cocoa. Yes, cocoa has served as well, mm -hmm. but that's not the issue. So it's not just about adding value. It's about diversifying your economy. Mm -hmm. And we discuss 10 new strategic anchor industries that can provide that diversification front. The third is to be able to enhance agricultural production and productivity. Because whichever way you look at it, we need to feed ourselves and to produce enough to be able to export. So that was the other very important outcome. And last but not the least is, how do we position Ghana as the most attractive tourist destination and the destination of choice in the whole continent. Mm. So broadly speaking, these were the four main uh, discussion pillars. Mm, I see. Yeah. And uh, listening to you now, I, I could easily argue that these are things that we have spoken about in this country for at least the last two decades or so. But, but that's the problem we have in this country. It's not about having spoken about it. What was the quality of the discussion that has gone on before? Mm -hmm. Who was leading that discussion? Was there a framework that lends itself to implementation? So, you know, and I hear it very respectfully. I hear this all the time. Oh, we've heard this thing before. You know, what have you heard before? Is it the we, same thing? We, I'm not talking about we, you. We've I'm saying a, that. No, no, and, and I want to generally respond yes, to what you're yes, saying. We've yes, heard the problems. Yes. We've heard solutions yes. that should have solved the problems. Yeah. But two decades down the line, yeah. we haven't seen any of those. And I was going to go to the fact that yeah. of, of those two decades, you've yeah. had quite a chunk of time in yeah. government as well. So yeah. if there's a problem, you admit yeah. that you're part of the problem. So let's start from where you, you oh. began. Mm -hmm. That we've had and heard this before. And there were problems that were discussed. I didn't convene this summit to discuss problems. I made it very clear that this was about solutions. Uh -huh. And the solutions must lend themselves to implementation. So when you tell me that we've heard this before, we've discussed problems and we had solutions, what were the solutions? What was the quality of the solutions? Who were supposed to implement those solutions? So that's where we come from. I don't want to, I mean, very respectfully again, spend executive time here to discuss what went wrong. I want to move forward. Yeah, I, and, 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 so, and so I'm talking about my solutions, mm -hmm. the solutions that have been crafted by people who know what to do, and then also submitting it to a general stakeholder group discussion. Mm -hmm. so, so the argument I'm making yes, is that yes. some of those solutions that were um, prescribed before, yeah. um, also fell within your purview as Trace Minister. Yes. And, and, and you have been a chunk of, of that uh, cycle where solutions yeah. should have been applied to the problem and resolved, yeah. but they didn't. So why should we believe you now? Yeah, but, but uh, okay, again, let's, let's understand that I've been 
uh, a minister in President Kufo's government. Absolutely. And then in President Kufo's government. Indeed. There's no debate about my record. I've had a very distinguished record in public service as Minister for Trade and Industry. Under those two administrations, there's no debate about that. But be that as it may, the reason why I'm passionate about what I'm doing and the reason why I'm running for president is because when you have executive authority at the highest level, then you can speak mm. to how your solutions are implemented. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Right. And you see, we have an executive presidency. The, exec the, the president is the one who not just provides the direction, but ensures execution and implementation. You know, so that, that, that is different. I mean, saying that, uh, but for example, I introduced the One District, One Factory Initiative. The most revolutionary and the most innovative industrial transformation program, not only in Ghana, in the whole, in the whole of Africa. Everybody knows that the kind of resources that my own government needed to have put behind the one district, one factory, to make it superlatively successful was not what was the case. Admittedly, we've always had limited resources. But I'm saying that if mm -hmm. I'm president, I will prioritize, for example, the implementation of the one district. But well, that's where the jobs are going to come from. Indeed. When you have the executive authority at the highest level, you, you ensure that you prioritize the deployment of resources in areas where you can optimize uh, uh, most benefits. Okay. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it's not just that you've been minister. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but in spite of that, I'm saying that if you audit my record, it's a very distinguished record. And, and we'll talk a bit more about that yes, record, but I mean, right? Yeah. But let's stay with the one district, one factory. Okay. Um, you say that it was a superfluous idea, fantastic. It was superfluous. Right. I, I want to use the word that you use. What, no, no, what was no. it? I, I say the most innovative. The most innovative. Yes. The most innovative idea. Yes, a revolutionary a program, industrial transformation. Okay. So you introduce the yeah. most innovative and revolutionary idea, yeah. which is the One District, One Factory. Yes, yeah. Would you consider it a failure at this point? It was a big success. But the president speaks about it. The vice president speaks about mm. it. But, but you, but, you but, just saw that the not, resources no, no, didn't no, go there. No, no, I'm saying mm. that we didn't optimize the deployment of resources. It could have made it even more successful. But it is probably the best program that this government can boast of. So where, see, where, where are these Before factors? I exited, before I exited, uh -huh. we, we, we have 296 factories at different stages of implementing. 296. Mm -hmm. 296. You know, so uh, obviously we cannot use the little time we are here to talk about where the... But you see, remember that one of the main objectives of this program was to bring industry to the doorstep of the average Ghanaian. When we come back, we'll talk a bit more about that track record and then also piggyback off some of the conversations that took place at the summit. You're watching Hot Issues, don't go away. Welcome back to Hot Issues. My guest today is Alan Kujut Tremanting. He's an independent presidential candidate. He's also the leader of Movement for Change. Honorable, thanks for your patience. So let's, let's go back to the summit for a little bit. Yeah. A few of the things that I heard and concerns raised particularly by uh, some of uh, the stakeholders there was the issue of taxation. Uh, the, you know, the general secretary of the TUC had mentioned that there's a lot of indirect taxes being paid by the poor people of this country. Uh, we see much of it still. However, we have huge tax holidays for uh, foreign companies that come into this country. Why, why is that a case? Yeah. Basically, the most important thing to know about taxation is its contribution to revenue optimization. It is government's revenue that is used to finance development. So if you do not maximize 
your revenue mobilization, then you do not have enough money to finance development. Then you have to borrow to finance development expenditure. And when you over borrow, then you run into a crisis. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what has happened to us. So mobilization of revenue, particularly from taxes, is very important. Generally, if you ask me, my independent view, because I'm no longer in government, my independent view is that the level of taxes in Ghana is too high. And it comes from a misunderstanding of the tax regime that is appropriate for Ghana. I'll, I'll explain to you. Mm -hmm. If you go to the matured economies, those who have economies that work, they put more emphasis on what we call direct taxation and less emphasis on indirect taxation. So you allow companies to become competitive by reducing their taxes. And then when they make money, then you have a reason to tax them. So in, in the case of Ghana, our whole focus is on indirect taxes. Mm -hmm. How we collect duties at the port, just because we feel that it is much easier to collect uh, that. So we try to maximize whatever we can from imports and duties and levies. But then you are killing your companies because they will not become competitive. So in the long run, there will be no profit to tax. And so we need to re-engineer our tax regime. That's the first thing. But admittedly also, we need to expand our tax base. Mm -hmm. And part of the problem with expanding our tax base is that we have a, 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 an economy that is largely informal. 80 to 90% of our economy is informal. Mm -hmm. So it is very difficult then to bring all informal enterprises, particularly micro enterprises, into the tax net. So then you have a situation where only a few companies are into the tax bracket, mm -hmm. and obviously the burden of tax is high, and then they end up maybe not having the same appetite to pay taxes. But whichever way it is, as a country, as Ghanaians, as citizens, we need to understand that we have to pay taxes. That is our responsibility to ensure that government has enough revenue mm. to support uh, our development. But the unfortunate thing also is that we don't only need to burden our companies with high taxes. The level of revenue leakages, the level of corruption in our country, if we deal with that, we don't need to pay those high taxes. So it, that's, that's, mm. that's where the problem is, is the corruption and the revenue leakages. These are two sides of the same coin. Right. If we fix that, we don't need to borrow that much and we don't need to increase taxes. Very well. The Mahama administration said the same thing. The Akufu administration said the same thing. They had very nice ideas as to how to plug the leakages and, and deal with corruption. But you know, here we are, we're still saddled with the same problem. So what are you proposing? But, but you see, uh, okay, let, let me put it this way. There are two may Ghana has so many problems. But if you ask me, there are two fundamental challenges that we need to address. One is fixing the economy, and one is dealing with uh, corruption. Now, if you look at the Great Transformational Plan, mm -hmm. what it will help us do is to make sure that we bring the economy back to life. Because once you bring the economy back to life, you have low inflation, you have low interest rates, you have a stable currency, you have a sustainable debt, you have large reserves. That is when you have a resilient economy. Once you have a resilient economy, things will begin to fall in place. Taxes will come down. Mm. Automatically, it will come down. And then you have more jobs uh, created. So that's the first thing. If Alan becomes president, I'll make sure that the economy works again. How and long secondly, do you think it will take you to do that? 
during the first step, if and when I become president, all the things that we are talking about, the economy will come back to life, even within four years. See, when people start talking about 10 years, 20 years, then you know that uh, there's a deficiency in what they are hoping to do. We don't need more than four to five years mm. to turn this economy around completely. Because what the building blocks it. that, the, yes, you see, if you, if next time in your, in your quiet time, try and audit what we are, we've proposed mm -hmm. in the uh, Great Transformational Plan, Indeed. and then you'll see that. But that's the first thing, making sure that we bring the economy back to life. But the second thing, if I were president, is to stamp out corruption. Is to stamp out corruption. Because once you are able to bring the economy back to life, mm. and you stamp out corruption, um, then you're on the path of... It, it, isn't that being done already, stamping out corruption? Don't you think? That is but do, do, do you think so? Oh, no, 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 that's for you. No, no, are but you, I, I, I'm telling you what, that, what, 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 that... That's exactly what I'm saying, that, that, that those are two things that... I will not negotiate. Yeah, and I'm saying, and, and, and I'm so, asking you, so, isn't that being done already? We have the office of the uh, the special prosecutor. We have Ioko jumping no, in every, and every now and then. We have Shraj. That does not mean that we are aggressively dealing with uh, corruption. And I don't want to use the little time we have now to be auditing the records of previous regimes. But there is no debate about the fact that the level of corruption in the, all the administrations is not sustainable. There is no way we can move from it with that, uh, with that kind of record. I see. So now you tell me yeah. uh, uh, whether or not you want to audit, but you tell me uh, what's your plan to stem corruption? Uh, first, it's about leading by example. And when we talk about leading by example, it's not just the president. The president and the people around the president and political appointees. That's the first thing. If I were president, no political appointee will have protection or safe, safe haven in cases where they are cited uh, for corruption. It's a zero tolerance for corruption. Obviously, we know that zero tolerance is... Yeah, it's, someone it's, told yes. us that before. Yeah, well... Someone told you, is that me? I'm not, I'm somebody. You, look, I mean, the but, point but, I'm making no, no. is you'd have to convince no, no, the Ghanaian people. But what I'm saying is that, look, I'm telling you about what I would do and my record. I've never been corrupt. I am not corrupt. And I'll never be corrupt. So my record is clear. And it's not just about me. I'm making sure that the people around you clone your, how you perceive things to be. So I, I, cannot, I, I cannot speak for others. I'm talking about what I would do. I'm saying that those are the two important things. But it just goes beyond just leadership by example. Mm -hmm. It's also making sure that there's deterrence through punishment. I mean, if people can get away, even when they're inducted for corruption, with sentences that can only convince them to come back to do the same thing, then that cannot be a deterrence. So we have to review the regime of sanctions and penalties for people who are cited for corruption. Hmm. If you go into jail for 50 years. 50 years for I'm corruption. I'm saying that if you were going into years for that then, now you see you are surprised. Yes, uh, yes. and again, I was going to ask what would be more punitive. Yeah, so uh, but I'm just yeah. saying that we have to review the penalty and sanctions regime for people who are cited for corruption. Then we also have to look at our institutions that have been established to fight corruption. Let us see whether they have the resource base, you know, to be able to fight corruption. Let us also look I at see. the so, laws and regulations, the so, procurement, uh, our procurement regulations, you know. Let us audit all those things. I and see. then we will be making a headway. Uh, you, again, the argument will be that if, if Alan had all these great ideas, um, was he holding back on the Akufuado administration? I keep on coming back to this point. That if you have executive authority, 
and at the highest level. Then you can make decisions and follow through education. Is, is that to say that you, uh, your recommendations, some of them were not adhered to, your advice on how to do things? No, I can't. I, I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm finding it difficult to understand uh, the import of the question. Well, because, so, I, because, I mean, I ask you why, yeah. if you had these No, because great corruption ideas. is not about Minister of Trade and Industry. And it's not just so, corruption, it's everything. Yeah, everything some, of the, yes. some of the great no, ideas yes, you're putting in yes, your transformational yes. plan. So I've played my part and I've said that you can see from my record that with the limited resources available to me during President Kufo's regime and during President Kufo's time, I've had a distinguished record. But I'm saying that if I have the highest level of executive authority, I will even do, I will do much more. So basically, that, that's the difference. No, it, it seems to me you don't want me to go there. To what go. I'm asking is, yeah. for instance, uh, on, on the issue of taxation, when uh, the Ghanaian people were agitating about how uh, overtaxed they felt they were, yes. people wanted you to speak yes. about it. Yeah. We didn't hear from you. No, but... Uh, when you say you didn't hear from me, I don't make official statements about taxation. Pe people that wanted is, you to distinguish yeah. yourself at that point, not when you are disgruntled with your party. No, but well, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I understand you because, in uh, maybe you, you you're not you've not really understood how uh, how politics works. You are in a government. Mm -hmm. Do you think it is fair or even sustainable? You have. Uh, process for decision making from one sector to the other. It goes through cabinet. Decisions are made. And then you come out and basically you, you are speaking against the same things that have been collectively agreed. I don't well, think that's... that's that, again, uh, the argument would be that knowing that there was a lot of corruption, knowing that um, the, the, some of the... Uh, you know, actions that were being taken were not ha helpful for uh, the Ghanaian economy. If you had stepped aside then, uh, then it, you would be more believable now. <laughs> I'm sure you have not closely followed uh, my narrative in right. politics. If you have, uh, you would not say what you're saying, you know. I mean, I'll give you one example. The economy got to a point where Everybody in this country was complaining. Yes, everybody was complaining. And it got to a point where the general thinking was that we may probably have to go to the IMF. Mm -hmm. The Minister of Finance who has responsibility for making final decisions, of course subject to cabinet on that matter, had indicated that we will not go to the IMF. If you check, I was one of the few senior members of government mm -hmm. who insisted that our economy had gotten to a level where if we didn't go to the IMF, the economy would crash in weeks. I came out openly to defend, the, but that was after that decision had been made. I was the, probably the only member of government who had the courage to come out and defend why I went to the IMF. Mm. But I didn't come out before just to take credit and then say that, uh, yeah, I'm asking government. It doesn't work that way. Is the IMF solving our problem right now? The IMF is providing a temporary solution. Is it working? It is working to the extent that it is now correcting some of the imbalances in terms of a fiscal consolidation effort, and then also maintaining a certain level of debt sustainability. Those are the two important things. Mm -hmm. Ensuring that your fiscal consolidation, that you are not spending more than you, you, you can absorb, and then also making sure that you reduce your debt levels to sustainable levels. And so the conditionalities or Better still, the conditions that have been imposed to make us be able to, I would say, receive support from the IMF. Mm -hmm. What that has done is to make sure that gradually the economy will be getting back to equilibrium. But that is only coming back to ground zero. 
because we went below ground zero. Mm. We are now only coming up to ground zero. Now, after ground zero, coming back to ground zero, that's the only thing that the IMF support can do. I see. It is just for budget support and balance of payment support. Those two things. That does not expand the economy. Can, can we... There is nothing that is going to happen mm. in the economy in 2024 in terms of capital expenditure. I was going to ask, do you let, think let, we can get to gr no, ground zero by the end of well, 2024? I mean, at least let's be a bit uh, hopeful that at least, you see, because but the government has no choice. If they want to receive the, the balance of the three billion, they have to make sure that at least they meet the requirements to get to ground zero. But you see, the most important thing, that's why I think that the Minister of Finance should not be taking credit for this, because in the first place, mm. he had said he didn't believe in going to the IMF. But what I'm saying is that... Should, should he go home as some people are... Uh, let's asking. discuss what we are talking about now. So what I'm saying is that the, the, the value of the IMF package, it will bring us to ground zero. But the interesting thing is that after 2024, if Ghana does not have a program of transformation, mm. which is what would expand the economy and create jobs, we'll go back to where we started from. So that's the whole essence of this transformation agenda. Mm. That by the end, because we've, we already have a, a, a 2024 budget. Right. There is nothing more that can be done. There is no expenditure, that nothing's going Indeed. to happen. But if Ghana adopts this transformation, great transformation plan. Industry would expand, agriculture would expand, and then the macroeconomic policy prescriptions that we are proposing, interest rates will come down, for the first time in the history of Ghana, it will come down to single digits, inflation will come down to single digits, we will have a sustainable debt level and we will increase our international And, and all uh, these within the f first term? First four years. Wow. You don't need more than that. Anybody who tells you you need more than that. Of course, that then allows you to then leapfrog in subsequent years to much okay. higher levels. One of the things that came up strongly <coughs> is uh, energy availability uh, to back industry up. Yeah. Uh, right now in this country, we are paying, or we should be paying, 15% uh, VAT on electricity. What is the proposal from uh, the Alan Chairman Ting team? Well, it, it's for me, it is counterproductive because tariffs are already high. If you compare uh, tariff rates to other countries that we are competing with, not even externally, but even Africa, mm -hmm. our tariff rates are already high. So it will make industry uncompetitive. People are going to lose jobs. That, that even is not something that should be on the table. So what's so the what I'm, So what I'm saying is that fix the macro economy. Mm -hmm. Because you see, the pass-through effect of, let's say, a depreciating currency eh, on energy tariffs alone is can explain to you why this is not. So what, if you have a stable currency and an appreciating currency, mm. then it means that right. whatever you import for purposes of generating ele ele electricity, that, that the import value is lower, you know, and then that then brings down electricity tariffs. So that's where Indeed. the problem but, is. No, and of course, the, the, other, the other things that... Absolutely. Will, will and I want there. us to look at those other things. Because yeah. the flip side of this mm -hmm. is the fact that it, it won't increase our generation capacity as a country. And so we'll still continue to have the deficiency, deficiency when it comes to uh, you know, energy or power supply in the country. You have in your plan uh, proposed renewable energy. Yeah. Isn't that expensive? Uh, no, uh, Kim, but let me just correct one right. thing too. But I'm very happy that uh, you have a, a very significant level of appreciation of the challenge, which is a credit to you. Currently, Ghana, we have excess generation mm -hmm. capacity. So that's not where the problem is. Right. In fact, uh, at least by the time I was leaving government, we had uh, excess. Right, but we are not paying our debt, so some of them have, have turned off. 
Well, but, but you know, that's, that's another <laughs> issue. So it is, the issue is not so much uh, the about question of the generation. additional generation. It's about transmission and it's about commercial losses, commercial and technical losses in distribution. So if you look at our transmission infrastructure, these investments were made so many years back. There have been no further investments in trans, the, the transmission infrastructure. So there are losses, transmission losses. Then when you come to ECG, it's even worse. The, the technical and commercial losses in the distribution of energy, uh, electricity mm -hmm. is such that if we don't deal with that, then tariffs will always go high. So that's, 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 but the bottom line is making sure that you stabilize the macroeconomy. Like I said, mm -hmm. if, you, if you fix no, no, the macroeconomy. We've talked about the macroeconomy. Yeah. Let's deal with the distribution. Of, the, of, of the, yeah. The, yeah, yeah. So, so how would okay. you deal with the, the leakages, the loopholes in, in that, the problems that exist between distribution and, and, and retail? No, I mean, for example, if you look at ECG, the, and the structure for, I would say, distribution, it needs now to be reconfigured into units that can be managed, you know, like what we call strategic business units, mm -hmm. and farmed out to the private sector. Because it's about collection. It's about billing and then collection. Now, so if you zoom and, uh, I mean, and you allow private sector involvement with targets, right. that alone would improve Co collection. But the more important thing is also about the, 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 the company as a whole. So we need to be able to review the operations of ECG mm. as, as a now. But of course, that's an extended uh, discussion. Absolutely. Yes. I was asking about but, but the commercial losses. Uh, yeah, you were talking about renewable, renewable. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, because that's something have, you propose in your yeah, transformational yeah, but plan. But we have no choice. Because of what we call it's, energy... It's expensive, isn't it? No, no, but I'll explain to you. Okay. Because of what we call energy transition across the whole world, that we have no choice but to gradually transition more aggressively towards renewables. Mm -hmm. Because the use of fossil fuel has a very significant negative impact on climate. And that is the whole thing about energy transition. So, again, it's a question of what type of renewable energy solutions are you looking at? We've been talking about solar, but we have not aggressively pursued solar because the initial installation cost of solar is high, but it's gradually coming down. And we need to be able to also develop the type of transmission and grid infrastructure that allows solar energy now to become part of our energy mix. Mm. But you are aware that government is aggressively reviewing nuclear energy. Indeed. That is also one of the most, uh, I would say, attractive sources of, of, right. of renewable energy. There's wind power. There are so many other things. Mm -hmm. you know. So the energy transition plan, if you look at the proposal in, in the and the Great Transformational Plan, mm. is to be able to fast track, you know, the energy transition program. This is not to suggest that the government is not doing anything about energy transition. There's right. energy, but it's about the implementation and how aggressively we pursue that. Again, I go through your transformational plan and I see you have a pillar on climate change. Yes. I don't know if it captures the current state of our water bodies thanks to uh, illegal mining and, and you know, the, the water uh, shortages and water challenges that we have faced uh, as a country over the last uh, year. What, what is the proposal from uh, Alan regarding the environment, how to deal with illegal mining so we can have our water bodies back, treat them and bring them to our homes. Uh, Kevs, this is a whole summit on itself. I, I <laughs> no, can imagine. <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole summit on itself. But I think to give you comfort, mm. we have, you know, we have five clusters in the Great Transformational Plan. The economic cluster, which is what we discussed, there's one whole cluster on 
natural resource management mm -hmm. and the environment. Mm -hmm. And I promise that I'll come back. Because my, we'll ideas, my ideas on Galamse and how to treat water bodies, and it's amazing. So we, we, when, when we come to the natural resource cluster, I promise you, I'll come for a full, it's because it's a whole summit on we, that We one. will leave it at that. <laughs> when we come back, let's discuss some more political issues. Okay. Don't go away. Alan Kojo, Chairman Tins, independent presidential candidate, is my guest today on Hot Issues. Again, thank you so much for uh, sitting with us here on the program. But um, I'd ask, well, what makes Alan different from John Dramani Mahama, and especially Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, particularly because people assume, uh, <laughs> you know, the NPP becomes a, a used-to-be denominator between the two of you? Well, let me start off by saying that. The Vice President, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, is the Vice President. Mm -hmm. He has had all the opportunity working with the President to do whatever he can do for this country. And let me be very, very fair to the sitting President. The sitting President has been fair to the Vice President. He's given him all the opportunity mm -hmm. to run this country. The man is tired. There's nothing new he can do. And that's, that's a fact. Now with my friend and brother, JDM, he's been president before. We know that there's nothing new that my brother can be doing. The people of Ghana are looking for an alternative. That is exactly what it is. They are looking for an alternative. Fortunately, they have an alternative who can get the job done mm -hmm. with honesty, with selflessness, with competence, and with integrity, and with a big vision. So that's the difference. The people want change. You know, and, and, and you have somebody who is ready to lead that change. So okay. that's basically what it is. And people don't realize, you see, somehow, maybe because I don't talk too much, people think that, oh, but where did Aran come from? And things like that. Again, the difference between an autobiography and a biography is the same content. One, you write it yourself, and the other one, somebody writes it for you. Mm -hmm. I've always hoped that people will write it for me. But if it's they are not- It's time to write your own. <laughs> I have to write my own biography. No, because no. God has been great to me. At your resignation announcement, September 25th, 2023, you yeah. said, all the promises made by the party leadership were never fulfilled, and indeed the divisive and hostile attacks on my person and my supporters remained for several years thereafter and have continued till this date. This was in reference to, to, the, uh, yeah. to, the, to the, the very old, first one. Yeah, the, the old very one, first one, indeed. Yeah, yeah. So my question is, yeah. It, this existed, even yeah. at the time that yes. President Akufuado, yes, yes, yes. Uh, you know, gave yeah. you that appointment. Yes, yes. Why did you take it if you thought that the party no, was being unfair to you? But, but Kems, uh -huh. I've been a founding member of the MPP. I've put my energy, my resources in bringing this party up. I believe in the ideals of the founding members of the party. Now, remember, I was the chairman of a group called the Young Executive Forum that really provided the financial resources for the development of the party from inception. Mm. That record is there. It is that same Young Executive Forum that brought to limelight people like Kojoba Radio of Blessed Memory, Kandapa, Minister for National Security, Kobne Japan, uh, all these all these great leaders of our party now, they were all from the Young Executive Forum. So I've, I've, I paid my dues. Mm -hmm. But it comes to a time when you have to make sure that you remain faithful to the ideals and not just to the, the party itself. I hope you understand. There's yeah. a difference. Mm -hmm. The ideals are there, you know. Enterprise, private enterprise, you know, making sure that you expand opportunities for people to unleash 
their own potential. Those are ideals that I believe in. But if I cannot get the party to be able to transform itself, mm. to remain loyal to the ideals, what's the point in staying there? Then it means I cannot, yes, it's true, I'm a politician. Mm -hmm. As I speak now, I'm looking for power. But remember, I am also fighting for a cause. I'm fighting for a cause. Yeah, so why did you take that appointment? Yeah, but, but why not? Because it's a, no, but you know, and I, normally I don't like to say this, mm. but the first time you were talking about the first time I resigned, mm. it took the party hierarchy to plead with me at that time mm. when I threatened to resign, to plead with me not to go out of the party. And so I felt that for a whole party mm. to find me so valuable, to actually plead for me to stay in the party. That in itself meant that but, 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 I was... So, but so the if attacks I continued. In, Would you yeah, say yes, that there was course. really true and forgiveness at that point? Well, basically, I have existed because of what I've said. Uh -huh. So what I've said exactly goes to... But your, 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 your question was, why... why regardless. I, regardless, yes. So I'm talking about mm. the faith in the ideals, okay. you know. And, and, but the party itself, they know that they have to transform. And they so, have to go through that transformation. So are your ideals now as Movement for Change any yeah. different from that of the NPP? I, I've gone beyond that. Okay. I've gone beyond those ideals. Okay. Uh, uh, what the movement now is talking about ideals, which is uh, uh, not just complementary, but actually taking it much, much further. On the subject of the NPP, yeah. Uh, four people were uh, removed from the party yeah. because of you. Yeah. Uh, where are they now? Oh, they are still with okay. me. Okay. Because it's about principles. Mm. And frankly, you just look at the people who are, they have our principles. Mm. It's, I mean, they believe, they believe not just uh, what I am, uh, what I stand for, but also the fact that they themselves are fighting for a certain cause, you know, and so I, I, I don't think there's a problem with that. There, there is the belief that there are those still within the party who have suffered repercussions because of the uh, support for you prior to your yes. uh, leaving okay. the party. Yeah. Should they leave the NPP and join you soon if, you know, I mean. Well, I, normally I, I, I try to leave that to their But judgment. are you surprised that I, that's I, happening? I, that, you know people are suffering consequences because they support you even yeah. before you left. But, but, yeah, 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 absolutely, and it is bad. You know, for me, how can a party that claims to believe, you know, in the values that, uh, I mean, the, the, the founders of the party established, be punishing people because they are fighting for a certain cause? But it is counterproductive because let me tell you one thing. Mm -hmm. You see, somehow, the two dominant parties, I, and I hear this conversation all the time, oh, that we have, you know, uh, six million people. They don't have it, I'm telling you. Mm. They don't have it. If between the two parties, their core membership, and you can check it, yeah. their core membership, meaning those who have registered, their core membership, in this case, may not even be one million, more than one million each. Okay. They do, what they are having are sympathizers and floating voters, independent voters. Okay. I'm telling you, the core members... And you think you have what it takes to close... No, but you but, know. but that's, okay. the, that's the whole thing. Okay. But I'm not here to debate anybody. Let's wait. We'll go. We'll meet at the general election. Because but, what I'm saying is that there are people who were looking at, for an alternative. They are not Cadbury members. But the six million people that vote for the parties, they, they are not registered core members of the party. There's a large number of people out there who can make a decision anyway that, look, we don't think that the party as they stand now can take us any further. Do you think you are reaching that I large am reaching, number? You see, I came out of the party mm. and some of my old colleagues were making noises. He can leave. He doesn't, you know. Nobody will fall, he can leave. I just made one statement. Mm. And I decided that, let me go to the stronghold of my former party. Right. 
I was just having a health work. You saw how many people came? 70% of the crowd who were waiting in Ashanti region okay. just to come to, uh, to the work, could not even get to, to Kumasi. Mm. So, well, but, but, let, but, but, let's but, meet but, at the general election. That's but, what but, I would say. But when we look at uh, independent presidential candidates, those who have attempted, those who have managed to get there, the performance has <laughs> not been one that could win an election. Is Alan wasting his time, perhaps, given that hey, Kems, historical context? Hey, Kems, uh, I'm surprised that you are even you have the courage to uh, talk about wasting my time. You know, no. You know. You see, because again, uh, we don't need to sit here to be evaluating others, their performance. You know, I can only talk about myself. Indeed. But I'm telling but you. But I'm using that historical not, context. No, I understand. But I'm mm -hmm. telling you that look. The circumstances are completely different completely for, different. for one or two reasons. Number one, I've been a dominant figure in Ghanaian politics. Mm -hmm. There is no village in Ghana where I go and they, don't, I, they cannot recognize my face or recognize my name. No village in Ghana. I've been a dominant figure in MPP politics. So it's different from what others have done. But I cannot talk about it the others. But beyond that, apart from the fact that I've been a dominant figure in Ghanaian politics, beyond that, if there was ever a time mm -hmm. in this country when the desire for an independent candidate beyond the two parties, if there was ever a time, that time is now. So it's the circumstances that create that difference. People are looking for an alternative who is credible, who is competent, who is honest, and who is selfless. Mm. That is the difference. I so see. let us not compare well, one of the my situation with others. One of the different things you've also planned to do is, again, if you're coming in as an independent candidate, you'd have to uh, have a team, people who work for you, and based on the constitutional requirements, you have people uh, from parliament. You have said that you, you're ready to work with both sides. Do you think <laughs> that if you were president today, um, you'd have people from the NPP wanting to work with you? I've made a commitment that I'm going to establish a government of national unity. That would involve people from NPP, people from NDC, CPP, all the small parties, business community, religious leaders, farmers, everybody. You understand me? That's a government by the people, for the people, and of the people. How can you even think that uh, uh, somebody from MPP uh, who has this opportunity to work in a new government mm -hmm. that is supported by the majority of Ghanaians who say that, no, I don't want to work in that government. Because remember, when I win power and I establish that government of national unity, and because of my record, mm -hmm. I can tell you, you'll be surprised the number of people. And I'm not, at that point, I'm not asking them to leave NPP. Serving in a government of national unity is not about, you can stay in your party and mm -hmm. serve in that. I, I, I take it as there'll be a lot of scrutiny, considering that, you know. Yes, because it will not be what, job for what, the boys. What would it, it take? It, of course, it's now going to be based on capacity and capability. I mean, why, if you don't have the capacity... Why would I be fighting to bring, but at any rate, why is it that people who are not necessarily in frontline politics, mm. but who have the capacity, why should we keep them out of government? If I feel that comes, the way you are uh, 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 drilling me in my interview, you have the competence, does that mean that you should be a member of I want us to, before uh, you can serve in government? So we've seen you do a 360 return to the party. Is there a future like that? Would you ever return to the party? What would it take? No, but um, I have established my own political movement. Yes. And I'm fighting to become the next president of Ghana. So the return that is not on the table. I am, because basically what I'm saying is that I'm asking the people of Ghana to put their faith and trust in me because I'm going to get the economy to work again. I'm going to fight corruption. Mm. And so 
basically the issue of going back, going back to do what? Well, we've seen it before. No, no, We're I'm, just asking. Oh, no, no. So, but, but it's different. The circumstances are different. Mm. The circumstances are different. Obviously. And I can tell you that a lot of people in the MPP are not talking. Mm. A lot of because they know my performance, they know my credibility, and they know what I'm going to do. Okay. They are not talking. Please don't contaminate them. Let them wait and take their own decision I, I, when the time comes. I have no contaminants. <laughs> but I do want us to discuss the elections. And um, as an independent candidate, you're not an IPAC. Uh -huh. But a lot of decisions will be taken that would affect you. Well, I think that the Electoral Commission would have to consider the role that independent candidates would play in the IPAC architecture. Because mm -hmm. these are potential uh, uh, presidents, mm. you know. That's, and, that's a proposal I, that the NDC has made in the last uh, yeah. IPAC meeting. Yeah, so, so it seems you're on the same wavelength with the NDC well, on, on that score. Yeah, because I think that it's only fair that if I come out, you know, as an independent candidate, um, there must be an entry point or an arrangement for us to have representation. Mm. Yeah. But do you see how that could um, impact your bid to, to be president, your presidential bid? Do you see not being on IPAC right now? Well, um, as I said, uh, we, are, we are having discussions on that one. Okay. But uh, I think the important thing is for us to go ahead, or for me to go ahead and prosecute my, my campaign. Because Indeed. in the long run, is the people who are going to vote. All we require the Electoral Commission to do is to provide a level playing field, you know, for all candidates. And hopefully if they agree for independent candidates you, to be represented, then that will be a good thing. Have you heard some of the reforms that the Electoral Commission is proposing? Uh, one of that being no, would no longer use the indelible ink, the other also being uh, closing the polls at 3 p.m. We know yeah. that uh, IPAC discussions on, on moving the elections yeah. from December 7th to November. Yeah. Uh, what's yeah. your position on these? I, I, they are all positions that um, I kindly am reflecting mm. in my governance cluster. Right. So at my next interview with you, I'll tell you my final positions on that. If this bid fails, could that be the end of the political career for Alan Chermanti? Absolutely no. Because as I said, I'm fighting for power, but I'm also fighting for a political cause. Okay. And it's, it's as simple like that. So if it fails, so you there, come there, again. There are two sides. There are two sides of the same coin. There are two sides of the same coin. Okay. I'm so, trying to understand that. If it fails, yeah. you come again. Or you are hoping to have a political party at the end of the day. Uh, let, 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 let us not talk about that. Let's talk about when I become president. Okay. So that assumption, it, it, it's not an assumption that we should be discussing Do you, do you hope? We, uh, well, that because, okay, carry on. Do you hope? Yeah. Or are you looking at a future where movement for change morphs into a political party? Oh, it's a, it's a transition that transition. would occur naturally. I see. It's, it's a transition that will occur. Because, um, uh, as I said, the important thing is not the fact that it's a political party. Mm. It's the architecture Around of a it. new government and, and a political system that is important. So Alan is going to be around for a while? Yes. Indeed. Hopefully, as the... Next president Next of the Republic president. of Ghana. We wish you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you so much for sitting with us. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. My guest today is Alan Kojo Tremonti. If you just joined us, you missed the conversation. There's always a playback on YouTube. I am Kemeni Amana. I'll be back with another enthralling conversation next week here on Hot Issues. Bye bye.